Thank you for joining us today for a segment of our virtual speaker series by the American Sleep Apnea Association, also known as sleepapnea.org. I'm your host today, Adam Amder, uh, and we're here uh, along with our community to, to get beyond this COVID crisis and manage our long-term chronic health issues. We are thrilled, honored, and humbled to have with us today Dr. Siram Parthasarathy out of the University of Arizona, professor of medicine, chief of the Division of Pulmonary Allergy, Critical Care, and Sleep Medicine, director of the Center for Sleep and Circadian Sciences at the UA Health Sciences, medical director of the Center for Sleep Disorders, Banner University Medical Center, Tucson, and most importantly, a long-term standing member of the American Sleep Apnea Association's Medical Scientific Advisory Council. I've gotten to know Dr. Partha Sarafi over the last seven or eight years as our journey uh, from a, a uh, one-stop shop, inter, uh, one intervention only, uh, doctor-run, patient-led, patient organization to a patient-led, patient advoca advocacy, innovative uh, sort of group that's uh, stepping on a lot of toes. Uh, so with that being said, let me throw it to Dr. Uh, Sai for short, which is easier for most people to, to pronounce, even though I actually can pronounce Dr. Sai Rampartha Sarathi's name uh, without butchering it for once. <laughs> So welcome, Dr. Sai. Thank you, and thanks, Adam. Thanks for the uh, kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. So w the, re the, the real primary reason is that, that we want to have you here and, and sharing with our community is, is you've been doing some amazing work uh, with the, the advent of the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute funding uh, that came out of the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, almost a decade ago now, and it's actually been read up by Congress and one of those studies that you've done is called the PCORI Peer Buddies Program, and that's sort of a mentee-mentor program uh, for apnea patients to get better adherence uh, with their CPAP machines for those that are struggling with it, since sleep apnea education and most apnea patients are just thrown in the machine and uh, are, are pushed out the door sort of as a, you know, good night, good luck, chance of uh, hope, hope, hope you do well with the, the, your therapy. And uh, Dr. Partha Sarathi has done a validated scientific intervention uh, over the last couple of years that uh, we're in talks about now how are we going to make this scalable for the, the, the future since we're under this COVID crisis and the world is sort of flipped upside down and telehealth is now the primary uh, act of connecting with your primary care physician or most of your specialists unless you need to actually go into the clinic's offices. So with that, I'm going to throw it back to, to, to Dr. Sai and let him sort of give us a breakdown and a rundown uh, with his slides about uh, his program, and, and, and then we will catch up when he's done. Thank you so much. This is now, a, in some ways, uh, this is work that I see myself as a facilitator uh, and a project uh, champion. Um, however, the idea for this uh, project originally came from a patient of mine. Uh, this patient uh, had a fantastic uh, response uh, to um, the CPAP uh, treatment, and uh, he told me, and I vividly remember him sitting in my office when he said, you know, uh, patients need to benefit from this treatment, and um, if there is anyone out there, any patient of yours that's not using this device and is not benefiting from this treatment, bring them to me, and I will make sure that they become adherent because I want every patient uh, out there to actually experience the full benefits of this treatment and getting rid of this uh, apnea-related symptoms. And so I volunteer myself. And so that got me thinking. So in some ways, uh, the idea for uh, this uh, project came actually from a patient. And, and it's very patient-centered um, because it makes... Uh, uh, the program tailored around a patient's need, and and it originated uh, from a patient. So I'd like to start with that, and then I can share with you uh, some of my uh, slides, um, you know, which essentially outlines the program and the backdrop. You know, so one was this patient telling me uh, about this, and of course, this is funded by the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, uh, which uh, funded a original study. Um, which was aimed at doing a comparative effectiveness where we compared uh, a peer-driven intervention um, orchestrated through an interactive voice response system. And I'll explain um, what that is. Essentially, it's a peer buddy program where peers intervene to help other patients improve their CPAP usage 
and therefore benefit uh, from the treatment. Um, and it's orchestrated through um, a regular phone line. And so that way it doesn't require a sophisticated, um, you know, laptop with a high-speed connection and, um, you know, a video camera and internet access because there are patients out there who don't have those amenities. And we are recognizing that, especially during the COVID crisis, is that there are kids who are supposed to learn online, but they don't have a laptop. They don't have a computer, even if they have one, it's old, and they don't have an internet connection. So I just wanted to say that our system originated from a patient. It is bare bones, simplified, um, patient-centered, and it does not discriminate amongst patients. It reaches out to everybody for them to benefit. So um, if we you know, move on to the next slide, you know, I can actually tell you what were some of the problems that patients are experiencing. You know, first of all, if I go through a rapid set of seven slides to give you a backdrop, as to what the patient experience is right, you know, uh, right now and why we should improve that will become immediately apparent. So the first thing is, is that patients complain about sleepiness. And in a different project, which, Adam, we did this one with you, uh, with the American Sleep Apnea Association, it was an engagement award, and um, where uh, you disseminated surveys uh, to over a thousand odd patients who were um, part of your um, American Sleep Apnea Association membership, and they talked about how their symptoms uh, of sleepiness or tiredness or fatigue or whatever they named it existed for 10 years before they were actually diagnosed. Why is that? You go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that it's almost a don't ask, don't tell policy. In other words, uh, between high blood pressure, heart problems, diabetes, asthma, and things of that nature, sleep gets lost in the shuffle. And something that is eminently fixable and correctable and identifiable gets ignored because of all of the downstream consequences of sleep apnea, you know. And so there isn't time in, uh, to talk about that in the physician's office. So if a patient doesn't bring it up because they're talking about their diabetes and their high, high blood pressure and their heart problems, there isn't time to get around to talking about, you know, sleep-related problems in many offices. So no. sleep does not count figure there, and it doesn't show up in the review of systems, which is uh, how we try to figure out if there's something else that needs medical attention, and it doesn't feature there in, as a standard question in review of uh, systems. Uh, if we go to the next slide, what's the other barrier is that even after they discuss their sleep problem, uh, there's a lot of uh, anxiety and fear uh, about knowing where to come at a given night, having to stay overnight in a hospital. Of course, we have home sleep studies um, that can be done, and they are gaining popularity, um, but there is a problem with those as well. You know, people need to come to a large healthcare system, navigate their way through the process, come back again the next morning to return it or ship it back and things of that nature. So there are some learning processes involved, um, but it doesn't stop there. If we go, you know, go to the sleep study uh, per se, it is not very patient-centered. You know, people need to wear this device either at home for a home sleep study or in the laboratory with a lot more electrodes. It's uncomfortable. Patients tell me all the time about how, uh, you know, uncomfortable that is uh, uh, to be wearing uh, these things and sleeping. And I myself, in a research study, wore one of these things and found it to be very uncomfortable. My sleep that night was not a, a good night's sleep. So there is plenty of room for improvement in terms of how we do a sleep study as well. And if we go to um, the next uh, uh, situation, which is, you know, they just sit there and they wait for the result to come. Some clinics turn it around in two days. Some clinics turn it around in seven days. Uh, so there they are waiting to hear about it because our current policies prevent a technician, uh, rightfully so, from sharing what their gestalt about the sleep study was, you know, um, Ideally, in an accredited center, the results should come from a healthcare provider who is credentialed to be able to making the final adjudication about whether they have sleep apnea or not. Um, but nevertheless, the time delay is, again, not very uh, patient-centered, so there's room for improvement. If we go uh, to the next stage of, uh, you know, situation is that let's say they get diagnosed with sleep apnea. Um, you know, the, there are some home care companies, even before COVID happened, they would drop ship these, um, um, you know, devices. And uh, there are all kinds of policies that were regulating how 
this should be, um, you know, um, uh, orchestrated or delivered. And now during the COVID uh, uh, crisis, because uh, in-person, you know, visits are disallowed and social distancing is being practiced, now there's a legitimate reason for these durable medical equipment companies to essentially ship them a box. And I've seen patients in a CPAP education class where initially they're allowed to see their machine and their mask and, you know, sort of feel um, what it feels like for their touch and how to, you know, you know, sort of play around with it before the class starts. I've seen a patient wear a CPAP mask upside down. Uh, so uh, all I'm trying to say is, is that this is something that can't be taken for granted. There, uh, there's a lot of education that needs to be done. And, and it doesn't stop there. Once they get the machine and they go to sort of the next phase where they're using it in the first 90 uh, days, uh, if you go to sort of the next stage of their experience, um, uh, you'll find that these gizmos and machines are, you know, sort of complex. There are SD card chips or there are telephone chips that are embedded in them that talk to, uh, you know, uh, the, your local telephone company tower. And there are, you know, situations where in hilly areas where they don't have good cell phone reception. Uh, or they are mailing these SD cards in certain uh, facilities or in certain communities. And the next thing that happens, if we go to the next slide, you'll find that um, patients who are using it for about, you know, um, 90 days, if we move to the next slide, um, you'll see that, um, you know, these patients, if they're not using uh, the machine, um, after they mail in the SD card, um, they end up uh, being told uh, that in the 31 to 90 day period um, that the mask will be and machine will be not covered by the insurance any longer. So essentially the machine is either removed or the patient starts getting uh, bills for them to actually pay uh, for the device on their own because the insurance company uh, won't actually cover uh, the cost. So in sum, if you walk through the entire step, there are many, many barriers um, at every stage of the game uh, that a patient experiences. And so this is something that we are trying to tackle one step at a time. And our main uh, area that we are tackling is more uh, confined to the la latter stage where you have DMEs dropshipping, patients not getting enough education or supportive care. Um, you know, it's just not the delayed diagnosis, the fragmentation of care. You know, the silos of care delivery between the healthcare provider and the DME company and, and the insurance company, uh, but also that we are dealing with a complex device based therapy. It's not a pill. You know, taking a pill with, and sipping with a glass of water is easy, but this is a complex device based therapy with all the gadgets and gizmos. And then on top of that, you have uh, a, a behavior change that needs to happen. So, what we did was originally, um, you know, we engaged various stakeholders in this area. So we just then, we got the idea from a patient and the patient said, you know what, you know, bring people to me and I will do that. Now in the past, the ASA has been doing the awake groups for a long time. And so where there's support being rendered by a local volunteer who takes, uh, gathers some patients around with some coffees and cookies. And I've done this, uh, you know, when I was in Chicago, I've been to a place of worship, uh, I play to a public library uh, on a given uh, Saturday or Sunday, um, and actually um, there will be about 20, 25 patients that will show up. Uh, the local sleep technician or a patient with sleep apnea will volunteer to put it together out of the kindness of their heart because they're volunteers and they're interested in the wellness of the community. And then in a unstructured manner, share tips and tricks about sleep apnea and invite uh, providers or doctors or respiratory therapists to come and give talks over there um, so that patients can gain understanding. So I've been in a church in you know, downtown Chicago. I've been in a local, uh, in a public library in the suburbs of Chicago. And I've done this as part of the awake group of the American Sleep Apnea Association. I think it's great service. What we wanted to do is do something a little bit more structured and scientific manner to see if that good work that's been ongoing for a long time whether it can actually help promote uh, treatment benefits. Can it help patients have patient-centered care? Can it help them use the CPAP machine longer and therefore gain more symptom benefits? That's what it's all about. 
And so when we were wanting to do this, even though the idea originated from, you know, a patient or from a patient advocacy group, such as the ASA, what we wanted to do is see if how we would put the study together. So in the conception phase of the study, we involved a lot of, um, you know, individuals, um, um, stakeholders, as we call them, and patients. If we go to the previous slide, uh, you will see that um, there are various entities. You, know, you have patients, you have uh, what we call peer buddies. These are the, essentially the business end of this entire operation. These are patients who have been using the CPAP machine really well and are experienced users and have a sense of volunteerism that they actually want to help other patients. And then we have various kinds of providers. That's doctors, psychologists, there's uh, um, you know respiratory therapists, sleep technicians, and so on and so forth. As well as we had you know public advocacy organizations such as the American Sleep Apnea Association, um, and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, which is a professional society, insurance companies. We had you know various uh, private as well as we had CMS Innovation Center um, that actually gave their initial input as well as uh, you know, product manufacturers, companies that make the CPAP machines, all of them got together and said, okay, this is how you know, we would want to do the study. And we did something called a non-binding input. And so the whole concept of non-binding input is that they give input without any expectation for them to buy the final product. So if insurance company comes and says, well, we think you should do it this way, and then we will you know, think about implementing it to our beneficiaries. But there's no obligation. For them to do that just because they mentioned it which is very dissimilar to if you're making a bid on a home where you ask someone to fix uh, you know a shingle and uh, you know you're sort of on the hook there you know if they fix the shingle then you're on the hook uh, to either you know buying the home or paying a penalty uh, that's binding that's a binding input um, whereas here it's non-binding input they can walk away even after giving input so the whole idea is, is that that allows them to freely talk to us about what are the things they like about it, what are the things they don't like about it, so that they can shape it the way in which finally it'll gain legs and it can run. And then once all of that input was received, we went through an initiation phase and we continued to engage, um, you know, the uh, various stakeholders, including the American Sleep Apnea Association, every six months or three-year period during the conduct of the study, where they continued to help us how to better refine uh, help uh, improve the study's success, but also get to a point of what we call dissemination and implementation, allowing us to be able to disseminate and implement uh, the actual, you know, study uh, finding. Okay, and so uh, so this is essentially the um, the roadmap of how the study works. Is, is that the peer body is educating the patient, and um, if you hit the next slide, um, it will show up uh, a graphic of what um, uh, you know, the peer study looked like, you know, we had about 317 patients who were potentially approached, out of which 307 were found to be eligible. 86% or so of patients in the, in it, who are approached uh, in that manner were agreeable to participate. That's a pretty high acceptance rate. Yeah. And then they were either receiving this peer-driven intervention through this uh, um, interactive voice response system, essentially through a phone exchange line, or they were receiving educational materials, such as video or uh, educational notes over uh, the mail. And uh, when you compare uh, the two, we ended up with about 227 individuals who completed the study outside of people who you know, fell off from the study over six month uh, duration of time. And we go to the, uh, hit the next slide, you will see uh, that the results is that we found that the CPAP adherence uh, was about 50 minutes or so greater and a greater proportion of patients in the uh, PDI IVR or the peer buddy arm uh, were likely to use their CPAP machines for more than four hours on five days uh, in a week, um, which is essentially the threshold that Medicare and Medicaid and a lot of other third party payers use as a threshold for when someone is adherent versus non adherent. The problem is if they're not adherent and they don't cross that magical threshold, that's when their CPAP benefits or CPAP medical benefits is cut off from them or the machine is removed. So what we found is the number needed to treat or the NNT, as we say. In other words, how many people do I need to treat with this peer buddy approach for me to save one person from losing the machine outright, right? Because on the one hand, it's about you know a 50-minute nightly usage difference. On the other hand, you have someone 
to lose their CPAP machine. That's a pretty big deal. And so what it showed was that if we treat nine people with a pure buddy arm, one of them um, can be saved from losing their machine outright uh, by using this particular intervention program. So if we go to you know sort of the next slide, so you can see their MNT uh, there, and if you go to the next slide, um, you know that these were all the other measures that we collected. We found that it not only was there improved CPAP usage, um, but one of the the primary endpoints of the study was patient satisfaction. We found that patients were more satisfied with the global evaluation of care. Now patients are very very astute and they perceive things that uh, providers and healthcare systems don't. You know, how you room them, how you call them when you're trying to see them in clinic, how you um, treat them at every step of the way, how you make it patient-centered. Um, those are all just as important as whether finally their medical condition got taken care of. So that global patient satisfaction is what a lot of third-party payers are using to measure the quality of a program. And there are some healthcare providers, healthcare systems um, that are living in the dark ages where they think that that is not something that's important. And that is not true. A, a vast majority of our, uh, healthcare organizations and third party payers realize that patient can actually do in their mind a full summation of their entire patient experience, as we call it. You know, that patient experience is poor. Uh, in some ways, that's not a passing grade uh, for healthcare provider or the organization. And so patients are the ones who chose that that is their number one endpoint. So our study was, was powered and constructed with patient satisfaction as being the primary endpoint uh, of global um, assessment of how the healthcare was delivered and what the experience was like. And and, 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 and and Sai, I don't mean to cut you off, but that that's really a great point to really delineate to our our population, our audience. This is the first time that you've had an intervention study that was looking at uh, improving our patients' education, but most importantly, what is the quality of life outcomes that matter to us? The so-called PROs, the patient reported outcomes, the benefits far outweigh the risk of getting this education, and we're seeing it firsthand. You're seeing it here what you just done and, and you're to be commended for that. I mean, I haven't seen these slides put together yet and I've been working with you on this program for a long time and it's nice to see this whole story now in retrospect told it, you know, it, it's understandable. You can see how how broken and how many barriers and obstructions there are have been along the way. So I'll let you get back, but I, I had to throw that in there before I forgot my thoughts on. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and you know, I've had um, some um, editors of major journals tell me, oh, um, a greater patient satisfaction, that is a soft endpoint, as opposed to minutes of usage of CPAP, which is a hard endpoint. And I found that to be appalling. And that is why I think there needs to be a change with regards to health services research. I'm not talking about amount of coronavirus, um, you know, uh, uh, mRNA or, you know, uh, in the bloodstream. That's a hard endpoint. I understand it's a target endpoint, and in a biomedical research study, that should be the outcome. But in a health services research study, where the primary focus is helping you know, patients use the machine, helping them understand the treatment so that they get to use the treatment, um, this is not a soft endpoint. This is as hard as they come, and if you don't get a passing grade there, then you fail. And so to be questioned about that, um, I find it to be um, uh, essentially underscoring how much more education needs to happen uh, to certain pathways or certain paradigms that exist in, um, in how people recognize um, uh, you know, health services research, uh, especially patient-centered outcomes research. It's sort of, to me, validated the reason why the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute exists is because um, we need to do more patient centered research. We need to educate a lot of researchers out there as to what is patient centered care. We need to educate a lot of clinicians and healthcare systems about what is patient centered care. Don't get me wrong, a vast majority of people 
who are in the trenches, who provide the health services, who provide care, recognize that. These are the ones in the trenches. Somewhere there becomes a disconnect sometimes when you go into research land where they like um, something that is jazzy, uh, like uh, some new protein that's in the bloodstream or a new drug that would do wonderful things. But they have to recognize, as Everett C. Coop, our Surgeon General has, uh, our prior Surgeon General has said, is medications don't work if you don't take them. In the same way, CPAP could be a wonderful treatment device. It's not going to work if you don't use it. It's as simple as that. It's, it's, and so it's, the other thing... It's these parallel paths that, that you've laid out here, you know, for the, for the sleep apnea education with the prior history of a chronic disease like the diabetes world and how that is reimbursable now and how this is the only intervention. If you don't use it enough, they'll come and take it away from you, whereas it's the, it should be the reverse antithesis. They should be giving you more education, helping you figure out why you're not using because we know the benefits of using the therapy, but not the... We don't need the, the data points. We don't need to know how many more hours you're using. We need to know, did you get out of bed? Did you go to work? Were you a better person? Are, are, you, yeah. are, are you more productive? Are, are you, is your state of mind, uh, are you a positive uh, asset to society or are you a, dra a drain on it? You know, and it's, it's, this is where I think we're starting to bring in the Eastern and the West, and the, and the west side of, of the world and the mindset. And, you know, this is where this opportunity and this, this COVID crisis is really sort of exposed and pulled off all the band-aids for better or for worse. I, I, I see, I really, I'm optimistic about, I think we're going to fix a lot of things because of it. It's sad. It's horrendous. It's, 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 it's despicable that anybody's had to die as a result of negligence or incompetence or, or just, you know, laissez-faire sort of that attitude that we've become numb to this world because it's not in our backyard. Uh, but at the same time, you know, this is, you know, people are dying for this stuff and there's, this is a chronic population and everyone sleeps and, and, and you've laid out a pathway here that I could see us, you know, starting to scale this nationally and having different messengers and getting the right information out there for newbies and for expert patients, how to manage your CPAP, but then how to manage your other chronic co-occurring conditions, how to, how to, how the caregiver can be best, uh, an asset to your, your treatment team. And there's so many things that should come out of this group and this, this network that we're building here, where it's not behind the so-called, you know, proverbial HIPAA wall, which is the thing that, you know, Sai, that you and I have been going at for all these years is how do we get to these awake patients? They were never our patients. They were our groups, but they were never our patients. Now, because of the telehealth and because of the virtual world, they're now our patients. They got to come to us first. And, you know, this program is the kind of thing we can now put out there in an electronic, you know, digestible format where women, and we can measure these patients, you know, taking this training and learning how to use their and seeing the outcomes as a result of it without the bias of industry, which is, that's what makes it even that much better science. Absolutely. And what is the need of that? This is a, I mean, a map of the uh, country and uh, you have these, each one of these dots, red or blue dots, are patients in those respective zip codes. And in a quarter million um, individuals, we had 170,000 patients worth of data, and we had 16 years worth of data. And what you see is that the red dots are the people who are not using the CPAP machine according to the Medicare criteria. The blue dots are the ones who are using it according to Medicare criteria, meaning more than four hours uh, for five days out of uh, seven uh, a night, uh, in and this a is not and this is not a political chart. This is just people using and people not using. <laughs> it just happens to be yeah. red and blue. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And we found that fifty-four uh, percent of people were not adherent in the country. And and when you look at them by their socioeconomic status, based on the median income quartile that they fall into, based on the zip code of residence, you can see a nice stepped pathway. It's almost like, you know, they say it's like a dose effect. You know, as your income, you know, you know goes to a higher bracket amongst the quartile, you in the green columns to signify the proportion of people who are adherent. And you can see, first off, in, in every uh, quartile, there are more non-adherent people, meaning blue lines, than adherent people, which is the green columns. And... But if you go from lower socioeconomic status from the left side to the right side, which is higher socioeconomic status, you can see progressively, it's almost like a stair, stair, stairway, you know, where you have a progressive stepwise increase 
in the number of proportion of people who are adherent to the CPAP machine. It's like math. And so what it suggests is that there may be an issue about uh, knowledge, understanding, something that we call about, they would call health literacy. You know, just because, you know, someone has a PhD, that doesn't mean they're health literate. Health literacy is for them to connect the dots. If I have sleep apnea, I'm more likely to have high blood pressure. If I have high blood pressure and untreated sleep apnea, I'm more likely to have uncontrolled blood pressure. If I have uncontrolled blood pressure, I'm more likely to develop a heart attack and die early. They need to be able to do those dot connections. And so for them to do that, that's something called health literacy. So they can read, write, carry on a job, get a PhD, but they may not be health literate. And the assumption is that someone who gets uh, you know, higher education is more likely to be health literate, but that isn't necessarily so. And so we need to show that, you know, the education is something that we can bring to bear to actually reduce this health disparity. This health disparity is palpable, and it's because of health literacy being low. Regardless of what SES class they come from, the more education you do, the more of the blue column you can convert into the green column meaning make more of them more adherent. More adherent. I, I, so I, think, I, I think one of the things that, that I'm sure you also will see, and I think what makes our disease so, so much different than most others is because most of our patients are cognitively uh, sleep deprived. That means they're cognitively impaired. It's how do you introduce that education? Do you throw it all at once and, hey, you got to remember it all? Or no, we know we're sleep deprived, so that's why we got to give it to them in small doses so that they can understand how to connect the dots and not just because most of us don't show up until 10, 15 years later till we actually get a, let alone a correct diagnosis, let alone the right treatment plan for us. So sorry to cut you Absolutely. off. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think that's a very important point. And so what we are planning on, you know, what are you doing right now is that, you know, across the sleep centers, you know, you know we are training um, you know, uh, patients so that then they can, we can do train the trainers. Each patient trains three people that they know, uh, you know, and they use the free uh, tools. Both, you know, we have a, something called a peer buddy training manual. Well, what is a peer buddy, a peer expert who needs to know about how to do this education? You know, people know this information, but what we do is we give them that checklist so that they can actually say, okay, yeah, you know, I don't recall having this problem, uh, but now that I read this problem, I do remember when I started off that it was, this was a problem. Because a lot of people climb that ladder, they get ahead, they're doing great, but they don't recall that they actually had the barrier unless you remind them about it. Now, they can share that. It could be their neighbor. It could be a, a friend of theirs who's struggling. And so they could essentially help it. So essentially, this is patients helping patients. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it was as simple for me, sign. You mentioned this earlier in the beginning of your talk. You know, sometimes between getting the diagnosis and, and going through the traditional system as is through the durable medical equipment, getting the machine and all that, it was a week, two weeks, sometimes a month for some patients. You know, that was the worst anxiety in my life because that first night of my split study intervention in a hospital setting, I got my treatment. And I, to this day, I was, it, it, it's beyond fathomable to me that I was allowed to walk out of there without it. Uh, whereas if I if it was if I had a diabetes diagnosis, I would have gone right to the pharmacy and got my insulin, and you know we would have been on our way. So, yeah. And so, why is it for CPAP uh, and sleep apnea that it doesn't work that way? You know, I you know if I were to be a, a patient that went and got diagnosed with diabetes, like you said, and I get a diagnosis of uh, you know I, I do a blood work before I go to my clinic visit. And then I'm told, oh, you know, your hemoglobin A1C is high. You have diabetes. Here, I'm writing a prescription for you to start a pill. I'm going to try the pill, and you need to do exercise. Um, but, you know, if you don't, uh, you know, get this under control, you're going to be getting, getting yourself shots. And so, I, you know, I got the message. I got the fear of God in me. And so I go drop off that prescription, or it's been sent in electronically. So I don't even have to make two trips to the pharmacy. That evening, after the visit with the doctor in the morning, I get to pick up my diabetes pill and I start the next morning. Why is it for sleep apnea? We have to jump through all these hoops where, you know, I have to wait, uh, you, know, uh, you know, three to four weeks to get a sleep study. Then I get the sleep study. It's uncomfortable. I don't know where to go. I, nobody, you know, has the time. Nobody gets paid to educate me how to do it. 
Um, and then um, I go get the sleep study. Then I have to wait for, you know, five to seven days because the next morning in the past, um, I remember patients were seen the next morning. They stayed back, had a cup of coffee. Yes, they were given donuts, I remember. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, normally they would be gone by 7, but they are here at 8 o'clock, and all four patients in the four-bed lab would be seen the next morning by the provider. And they would quickly look at the study. The provider would look at the study and say, you know what, the gestalt is, it's slam dunk sleep apnea. I'm going to write the CPAP. You're going to get it. So the patient got everything taken care of. Or they may say, you know what, you slam dunk, don't have sleep apnea. Or, you know what, you're at the cusp. We need to do the scoring of the study. I'll call you later this evening, let you know what it showed. Right. And so then they would call them and let them know what it showed. But the report will still get processed and generated, paperwork, six, seven, eight, ten pages. It'll take two to three days. But the machine would get Delaware, you know, literally the next day or a couple of days. Or there are some sleep centers where they would give up the CPAP machine. But no, the Stark laws tell you that you cannot keep the CPAP machine. Why? That's because we don't want to uh, you know, have a situation where someone is gaining the system. So yes, someone probably did it, but then all the patients suffer because of someone who did that, oh, and yes, system. they broke yeah. the law. They broke the law, but then it affected the patient centeredness uh, elsewhere. The other thing that happened was they said you cannot do same-day service the next morning for them to be seen in clinic. It's prohibited. Now, that may actually be the right thing from an insurance payer standpoint. Maybe someone gained it, but that's not very patient-centered. So they have to be seen on a different day than the morning after. Morning that's, after that, being that, that's seen what I never. That's what I never understood. Not only was I so severe that they had to treat me on the hospital ground, so I, it was then you know pushed into the split study pathway, so I was treated. Then I had a great initial reaction. So you got me with the momentum of having a good experience. Why would you want to stop that? Why, why put a, a two week pause in that when you got, I just got it, you know, let's, let's build on that, you know, and that I'm motivated to, to figure this out, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, there are some insurance companies that are patient centered uh, that I see, uh, they'll go on name. What they do is when they give the prior authorization for the sleep study, they give a prior authorization for the sleep study. They give a prior authorization for the laboratory study. They give a prior authorization for multiple sleep latency and a prior authorization for CPAP. And they give all the authorization so that once they get into the system, if they go through the process, we're not going back and forth with them. Well, there are some insurance companies who use the prior authorization as a barrier for reducing healthcare utilization. Because if, you, if they put a choke point in these utilization, then there'll be less utilization, there'll be more money for the stockholder. Now, that's a cynical way of looking at it. They also, I understand, they need to look at the, whether this was a prudent ask. Are we abusing the system? Are we overutilizing something? It's a fair thing, but there should be a way of skinning the cap. That's where all the researchers, the insurance companies, the health services researchers, patients, patient advocacy, advocacy organizations need to come together to find out hey, how can we make this so that the patient experience is a more positive experience like that of diabetes or high blood pressure? So my, my one suggestion, Sai, is, and I've seen this as the result of PCORI, and, and it's sort of been a touch nerve for me. It's not that it's patient-centered. It's we're all patients, right? Uh, or we're a, care, a caregiver, or, we, or we're one or the other at some point for, all, for our parents or our children in, in our lives. It, it really is, is it's, it's the end user. If, if this is the only industry in the world that is not designing with the end user outcome as, as the best interest from day one. Whether it's the research, whether it's the cl clinical trials, whether it's the policy, what, whatever it might be, whatever form of it is. And so, you know, you had your slide earlier about the socioeconomic. I mean, this is a disease where, yeah, it's a rich man's disease. You've got to go through all this to get, let alone get into a lab to get a sleep study, to have someone interpret a sleep study, which is a whole other conversation for another day we could have, which I think we should have about now, <laughs> since we're gone from the pre-COVID world to the post-COVID world about what now happens to testing in telehealth. But to come back to it, it's, you know, I remember I, I rented a machine, you know. I didn't know I could go out and buy a machine. I, you know, I was put through the rental. Then if I used it enough, then I could actually, you know, 
I can maintain that contract. And then the, the resupplies. But the cost of what I was paying for my deductible or my, my premium were three, four times of what I could find if I just went online. So that, you know, that brought us back to our CPAP assistance program, which we had all these gently used machines and, and donated supplies for people where it's like for a one tenth of their price, it's like, this isn't doing us no good sitting on a shelf or going into a land up. Let's get these masks and get these supplies, especially now in a time like that we're in when people have no discretionary income and, and we know they need their supplies and they, we know they need clean uh, resupplies so that they use their therapy so that, that they don't get sick, so that their immune system is not compromised, so that they're not at a hospital where we have to decide, oh, man, maybe we can't put them on a CPAP. We might have to intubate them now because the CPAP is potentially aerosolize, aer, aerosolizing the virus, which has got everybody scared. So, you know, that, that brings me back almost full, full circle towards, towards you and not only the research you've done for our patients, but now as, 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 a, as a clinician who's on the front lines of a critical care unit in the Southwest United States, you know, which is home of a, a snowbird population and a lot of Native American tribes and a lot of different socioeconomic groups, I mean, what is it that we do here? Is it a try it before you buy it? Do we remove all these barriers? Is this intervention not as dangerous as any other medicine or, or pill? Uh, is, is now the time that we take this opportunity to, to look at all the components of, of, this, of, of this field of, of the patient's best interest? And, 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 and is the peer-to-peer -peer program, is that part of it? Because it is a chronic disease that we live with. You can't, your five minutes, your 10-minute interaction with the patient is not enough for what someone's living with a disease 24-7, 365 days a week to manage. You know, we need our fellow patients that have been through the, the firestorm before and that have come out on the other end, you know, as a result. Um, we're going to improve the system, hopefully going forward, but, you know, we're also in the status quo that we're at now. So I know that's a, a mouthful, but I had to get it out there. <laughs> ah, no, you touched on a lot of important topics. I'm yeah. good, uh, you, know, uh, you know, pick on, you know, three areas and, uh, you know, uh, talk about that. First is... Yeah. Um, you know, during, you know, COVID times, a lot of um, medical care is being rendered through telemedicine and sleep is well suited for telemedicine. What we are finding is that telemedicine visits are more efficient. They're more patient centered. Um, you know, patients are able to get their uh, stuff taken care of. It's not the same as perhaps for, for someone with heart failure, you know, where, you know, a stethoscope needs to be put on their chest versus sleep uh, apnea related management is more symptom based. Uh, we are able to interrogate their devices, you know, right here where I'm sitting in my home uh, talking to you. I'm able to have a clinic visit uh, with eight patients right right after each other uh, for, you know, a half-day session or, you know, about eight to ten patients and be able to query their machines through the internet, uh, you know, uh, the browser um, and see their adherence and change their CPAP settings to make it more comfortable for them. And... And so it's very, very patient-centered. I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, is all that data that you're looking through that browser, that clin clinical browser sort of viewer that you had, is that making it to their, that patient's electronic health record in your, in your medical system? Yeah. And so what we do is, uh, you know, I have access to our electronic medical record system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, you know, I'm not, at, uh, you know, in the clinic, physical mm -hmm. clinic, because we're practicing social distancing. And, uh, of course, we are in the reopening stages right now. Right. And so we are able to, um, you know, output that PDF file, and I email it to my medical assistant. My medical assistant, uh, you know, is able to, you know, scan it and get it into the EMR system. So it gets in there. There are some systems where it's automatically the data is being siphoned into the EMR system. That, that exists as well where they have a platform that would actually dump the data into the particular correct EMR patient. Uh, is, that, no. is, that, so, is that data helping you or is it just claims data or is it just, is it actually improving the quality of care for that patient or, or is, I guess what I'm trying oh, to Oh, I think it's improving the quality of care. I can, you know, they say it is a bi-directional, closed loop telemedicine is what they call. In other words, I'm not only really knowing how they're breathing, how they're using their machine, um, what is the residual apnea count? What is the pressure set at? And uh, what could be the problem or the trouble or the leak is high? Or, you know, or, you know, they are having central apneas, even though they are on an auto CPAP machine, 
the apnea is not under control because of the following reason and not because of the leak problem. Right. And so not only is it giving me that kind of feedback information, but I'm also able to make changes, you know, where I'm able to increase their, uh, you know, excretory pressure relief, or, you know, their CPAP machine if the pressure is too high or drop their, you know, just the other day, a patient had actually, um, you know, had lost a significant amount of weight uh, due to a weight loss program that he's doing. And uh, I had to drop his pressure setting because that pressure that he was on when I saw him six months ago is too high for him because now he's 40 pounds lighter. And so I was able to empirically drop his pressure, you know, after talking to him, you know, uh, you know, essentially I didn't even drop the pressure. I was able to set the mode from going from a CPAP, I was able to set it to AutoPAP with a broader range with lower pressure uh, allowable. Right. And by that, it became more comfortable and it was actually helpful. So this is a two-way telemedicine system where it's a closed-loop telemedicine where I'm just not using it to see what his blood pressure or sugar right. control is. I'm also able to change the treatment through the telemedicine approach. In that real time. Huge. And, and, In real and, time. And, and you notice the weight loss because of the visual observation or because you were getting the data from an electronic scale? I wasn't getting it from an electronic scale, but the patient, you know, tells me, right. you know, that I've lost, you know, uh, that particular patient, I could not do a video chat with them on our video platform. Uh, that right. particular patient, I was having a phone conversation with them. And as you know, there's parity, um, you know, during this current COVID pandemic, there's parity for a telephone visit with the telemedicine visit with the right. in-person visit, as far as, the, you know, the healthcare system costs and uh, operations are concerned. So... The key question is, if that is more, uh, you know, I've been trying to do that for a lot of people in rural Arizona, you know, going back, yeah. gosh, two years ago, three years ago, I've been trying to initiate the program, but I was told, oh, this zip code, this county, uh, you know, telemedicine laws doesn't apply. This mm -hmm. county, it doesn't apply. That county, no, it doesn't apply. It applies for this specialty, but not for that specialty. So why are those rules there? Now, all those rules have been lifted, because we need to provide care, this is a very key point in time. Are we gonna roll back to where we're gonna say, we're gonna put those new laws in place saying, you can do this, you can do that, why? We did this during the pandemic time, it delivered the care, why should these policies be going backwards, literally in time and backwards in a philosophical, um, manner with regards to providing patient-centered care. If I have a patient in rural Arizona who doesn't want to drive two and a half hours, remember, there's a patient with sleep apnea, right. who's sleepy behind the wheel. Right. If he doesn't want to drive two and a half hours, and if we could prove that we can actually do it, why would we go back to the dark ages? Uh, so to pre-COVID time, that's a very key question that I believe that every one of us need to ask ourselves so that was, you know, one. Two is in the COVID era, we need to find better ways of educating patients. If there's dropship happening because of COVID, if face-to-face uh, -face visits are not possible, and, you know, I have a 30-minute visit on the telemedicine platform or phone. Um, but then what we are doing is we're, we're structuring, as part of our IVR system, peer buddy program, there were essentially 10 mandatory visits, quote unquote, that happened. These visits, eight out of the 10 in the original study were telephone-based visits, right. just like what we're doing now. Two of the visits were in-person visits where they can show the gadget and gizmo, how to take it apart, put it together, just like how a Marine would blindfoldedly, you know, pull apart a pistol and put it back together, <laughs> right? You know, and in the same way, we want to get them comfortable with the machine because that's a very important step so that they don't have technophobia. When they look at this machine saying, whoa, what are all these buttons? And what's this hose? What's this, you know, strap and all of that. Uh, if we can make them comfortable by making them operate it. So what we did as part of our current recovery funded program, which is our dissemination implementation effort, is what we created whole bunch of videos. And I know, Adam, you've seen some of those videos. They're going to be available freely to all of uh, uh, you know, members of the American Sleep Apnea Association to be able to access that. And those videos will make them comfortable. Each and every step of the way, they can get comfortable. And then there's going to be video you know, reenactments of both the in-person visits as well as the video visits. What are some of the questions that are being asked? 
what are some of the hard questions we need to ask ourselves? I had a, a patient of mine, I vividly remember, he was a young you know, grandfather, and his daughter, who was in her you know, uh, you know, late 20s, would tell him, hey, can you watch our three-year-old so that you know, I can have some time with you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, my husband so he can watch him so we can go catch a movie on a Saturday? And he used to turn her down saying, you know what? I'm so tired. I, you, know, I, you know, I'm lucky if I get through the day, you know, dragging myself, cooking my meals and having my cup of coffee. And, and so I just can't take care of the little one because I have to chase, you know, behind her. And I'm sorry, I can't. Um, but then after sleep apnea got successfully treated, he tells me, you don't know what a big difference this has made. Now I go and talk to my daughter and tell her, hey, drop off uh, the little one with me and you guys go catch a movie and then go catch dinner. And he said, this is, it's not about, it's not about how productive you are to society. It's whether you have, are exercising your God given right for you to be able to uh, enjoy and experience life. Like you know, and, and if you, and to live yeah. and to live, to live life in the fullest, can you, can you do that? And so if this is a barrier and if this made him actually spend more time with his grandchild, to me, there isn't anything better than success. Now, that is not a soft end point. Let me say, say that to you. That's a very hard end point. You know, it's as hard as they come. And that's sort of the, sort of the meaning of life. And when you say sort of the, sort of the philosophical approach that you're referring to, at the end of the day, it's not the amount of greenbacks you have in your bank. Wow. Is it's the life well lived? Listen, yeah, you, you know where I was eight years ago, and just starting to go down this road on the sort of research and all that side from my layman's vocabulary, and I think it's a great place for us to end this. I know we've already almost gone an hour, and I know we could talk another three hours. Both you and I, we have we have a, we have a lot to discuss going forward. At, like I'm sure, uh, but this is what you can see will also be a good precursor for part of what our conversation on May 15th at the third annual Awake Virtual Summit will be about. Um, so I'd like to remind everybody that if you haven't, to go to sleepapnea.org, register for uh, our third annual uh, Awake Virtual Summit on May 15th, uh, so you can guarantee your spot to be able to participate and interact with Dr. Partha Sarathi and some of the other doctors and, and go-to thought leaders that we go to uh, in our field. Um, looks like we, we might have lost Dr. Partha Sarathi's uh, uh, camera there, and uh, that's a common practice around here because of the, the new world we live in with bandwidth and, and Zoomer issues. Uh, so with that, I'll wrap up and say thank you, everyone, for uh, for coming. Uh, be sure to watch and, and, and join us on every Tuesday at 3 o'clock Eastern uh, when the Awake Sleep Apnea program series uh, premieres, and uh, we will see you then. Thank you and have a good day, and uh, make sure to get some sleep. And, uh, and if you also have a chance, please check out our Awake Angels uh, donation program for those that need CPAP masks right now uh, who can't afford them. Um, thank you and uh, be safe. Mm -hmm.